in the state's motion are um, properly subject to subpoena. And so that's addressing the employees of the district attorney's office and the district attorney. The state also filed a motion to quash the subpoena to Mr. Uh, Bradley, I believe is his name. Mr. Bradley is someone who was a former business partner of, um, thank you, the former business partner of Mr. Wade. He was also his attorney related to divorce and domestic matters. And that relationship began in 2015. 2015 FAR predates any allegation relevant to the motion. That attorney-client representation continued through and including, I believe, 2022. There is has been no waiver of privilege of that. And I believe that the evidence or the record before the court would demonstrate that defense counsel knows that this relationship, attorney-client relationship exists, that she knows there will be a privilege invoked, and that it just is designed to obtain more public relations, more spectacle, and that uh, the motion, I'm sorry, the subpoena to Mr. Bradley should should likewise be quashed. I believe Mr. Evans, if he's here now, will address in more detail the bank records, but given the court's representation, I, I, I won't go into that, I believe, um, if that was included, please correct me if I'm wrong, but insofar as the subpoena is has been issued for the bank records of Mr. Wade and his um, law practice personally, and other entities associated with them. That's clearly a fishing expedition that the law does not permit. Yes, the court to quash that is overbroad and harassing. All right, uh, I think there's a lot to take up there. Ms. Merchant, I wanna let you respond generally and maybe we'll descend into the particulars afterward. Great, thank you so much, Judge. Um, judge, a couple things on the state's response um, or the state's argument to quash, Judge. Um, first, I'd just like to point out the state is asking that this sworn affidavit from an officer of the court from Mr. Wade be considered. But when we were in federal court, Ms. Cross argued that an affidavit is not admissible. We don't believe an affidavit is admissible in this case. Um, it, you can cherry pick in an affidavit what you want to talk about. and There's no cross-examination. Um, so that is not, it's not admissible. We put that in our brief. We've argued that it's just not admissible. It's not relevant. It's hearsay. It's nothing more than hearsay. Um, we have a right to make a record on these allegations. And as long as we keep our evidence and our questions narrowly tailored to that inquiry, that is our right. Um, we have a right to explore whether or not there was a per personal or financial benefit to Ms. Willis from this relationship. And we have carefully chosen the witnesses that we have subpoenaed based on that. And I just wanna walk through a couple of them. Um, but but before I do, I, before I move on on the affidavit issue, um, Mr. Wade has filed other affidavits in his divorce case, which contradict this affidavit. His interrogatories, which were sworn and verified and filed in that case, said that he did not have a personal relationship, that there had been none. So we've got two declarations in two different courts, both sworn, both filed with the court that say something completely different. Um, his May, let's see, it was his um, May 2023 affidavit, where he was asked if he had and this was in 2023, Judge. So the state's response last last week said they had a relationship that began in 2022. In May of 2023, he filed in the Cobb County Superior Court um, a pleading that said specifically if he had had any relations with a person other than his spouse during the course of the marriage, um, you know, and, and the typical things that are asked in a divorce case. Um, and he responded, none. After we filed our motion, in this case, he updated those and he pled privilege under the Fifth Amendment. So we've got a filing under oath by Mr. Wade in 2023 stating he didn't have a relationship. Then we've got a filing stating he did have one starting in 2022. And then once that came about, he fixes got the date. We've got whether or not they cohabitated, whether or not there were any funds that he was paid that he used for travel with Ms. Willis. Um, we have quite a few documentations that we have attached to filings, and we have more that we intend to present 
at the hearing in this case to show that she did receive a lot of benefit, a lot of financial benefit in the forms of different trips, um, plane tickets, hotel rooms, Ubers, dinners, things like that. Um, we have all of those from the financial records, which I'll, I'll go into in just a minute um, to stay on task. Go into those in just a minute. Um, but that's as far as, as Wade, why we think that Wade definitely should be called as a witness in this case. Um, how can Mr. Wade not have relevant information to this inquiry? That is the, the real question here. He probably has the most relevant information to this inquiry. Same as Ms. Willis. She probably has the most relevant information to this inquiry. Um, Mr. Bradley, the state has taken it upon themselves to file a motion to quash uh, Mr. Bradley's subpoena. Mr. Bradley has not filed a motion to quash. Um, the divorce in this case was not filed until November 2021. The only privilege that can be asserted is things that were said in furtherance of legal advice. So if Mr. Wade made statements or comments to Mr. Bradley in furtherance of legal advice, we're not going into any of that. We don't have any intention of getting into a privilege dispute, what was privileged and what was not. The relevant information that Mr. Bradley has to this inquiry is that this relationship started prior to Mr. Wade being appointed as a special prosecutor in this case. He has firsthand knowledge that this relationship predated that. He has knowledge, and not privileged knowledge, Judge. The divorce action hadn't even been filed at that point. He has personal knowledge, not privileged knowledge, that they had cohabitated, had stayed at the same place. And you know, I'm, I certainly don't intend on getting into a, a, an argument over what the term cohabitated means. They had stayed together. He had, Mr. Wade had stayed at places that Fulton County was paying for Ms. Willis to stay at. He's got information about that. We have outlined all that. We've made a proffer. That is not privileged information, Judge. And unlike some of the, I guess, other witnesses that are here challenging their subpoenas, uh, I, my inference from the supplemental reply is that this is something that you have corresponded or communicated with Mr. Bradley about directly. Yes, only non-privileged information. Yes, Judge. All right, and so let's put the district attorney and, and Mr. Wade in a separate category. I think you would still, now that the motion has been filed, need to make some kind of showing for the other seven witnesses challenged by the state. And, and Judge, um, sometimes when we subpoena witnesses, if they would be fallback witnesses, for example, um, if Ms. Willis is not, if you don't force Ms. Willis to take the stand, then we would have to present witnesses to establish what Ms. Willis could be questioned about. And so some of those witnesses would be cumulative of what Ms. Willis testified, but they could be impeachment. It just depends. And so I'll go through all of those witnesses, Judge, um, as far as our belief that they have personal information. Um, how, I, how I sort of categorized them was we had Willis, um, Sonia Allen, and Dexter Bond, and then Daisha Young. So. Sonia Allen is the head of the anti-corruption unit. She's the one that started, um, essentially started these contracts for, for um, all of these anti-corruption contracts, which is where most of the outside counsel work in the DA's office is coming from. Um, she has personal knowledge about the relationship between those parties, um, about the financial benefit, about the contracts. She's the one that is the head of the anti-corruption unit. And, you know, just, just to, focus in on whether or not we have to talk to a witness before we subpoena that witness. There's no law that says you have to talk to a witness before you subpoena them. And that, that makes sense. Police officers regularly do investigations and they talk to tons of witnesses. You talk to one witness and it leads you to another witness. And you subpoena people who are not particularly willing to talk to you. I asked all of these people to talk to me. It's not surprising that they don't want to. They also all have NDAs. So they have non-disclosure agreements that they've been asked to sign by the district attorney's office. And so they're hesitant, and I, I'm not saying these in particular, but members of the district attorney staff are hesitant to talk because of that. But a court order, such as a subpoena, would go would would alleviate any of those concerns so, that they so have. recognizing that even if you don't have to talk to them i think you still have to have some kind of good faith belief of what it is they could possibly say that is relevant or that you could later impeach them on that then becomes substantive evidence right right so what is it let's just start with miss allen she right. starts the anti-corruption unit she uh, may have been there at the formation of these contracts but is there anything 
as part of that that you think plays into do you, into this to these issues just personal personal knowledge as to when the relationship started these witnesses would all have personal knowledge as to when the relationship started and when we say the relationship are we are we referring to just the fact that they knew each other or that they knew that it, it changed or evolved that it was that, that the relationship predated mr wade being hired as special counsel and what aspect of the relationship that their relationship was romantic judge i'm sorry i should have been more specific sure. so these witnesses all have personal knowledge and I've talked to a lot of different witnesses and a lot of witnesses, you know, when you when you're investigating a case, some witness may not have personal knowledge, but they might know someone who does have personal knowledge, things like that. Understood. So how, the, how do you know Miss Allen has personal knowledge of that from Mr. Bradley? OK. All right. And so theoretically, if Miss Allen testified and denied that Mr. Bradley would be able to impeach her. Right. Yes. Okay. Judge. All right. And, and the same with with the other witnesses, um, Miss Young and, and Mr. Bond. Yes, so the same the same argument. Nothing else to supplement that or to add. No, not for those judge. Um, there's a couple other other witnesses that we included. Um, one of them is um, so Robin Yurdy, who we'll get to in a minute, um, was Miss Willis's executive assistant. I subpoenaed her current executive assistant, which is Tia Green. Um, that's her personal assistant who keeps her calendars, um, does all of her scheduling. She can testify as to travel um travel that they they took together um spending different information about spending and then also the personal na nature of the relationship and then the other fo all of the other folks are well let's yeah. let, we're moving on uh you so that was alan and young you'd lumped uh bond into that same initial category where so what about him yes i did i'm sorry judge i lumped bond young and alan into that that same I, basically, I lumped the lawyers, Willis, Young, Allen, Bond, and Wade, all together as far as personal knowledge of when the relationship began. And although, again, just focusing on Allen, Bond, and Young, although you're saying you haven't, you don't personally have statements from them on the record or in some kind of documentary form, you're saying that if they deny knowledge, you have someone who can impeach that testimony? Yes, Judge. All right. Okay, let's move on to the next category, if you've got one. Tia Green. That, that's the executive assistant. Um, and I'm sorry, I jumped ahead on that argument. Um, Ms. Green is replaced Robin Yurdy, who is the former executive assistant, um, essentially does calendaring, keeps calendars, things like that, um, and can attest to when travel was made. Um, some of the things we've got, travel documents that, that we have to admit in other areas, but this would put Ms. Willis with Mr. Wade on these trips. And again, is this, we don't know what Miss Green would say, right. so is it just the fact that she keeps the calendar that you assume she knows that she's going with Mr. Wade? Right. Well, that she she knows that she keeps the calendar. She's her personal assistant, um, and so Miss Yurdy did that before, and Miss Green took over that job. But uh, other than saying, you know, it, it's possible Miss Green could just be saying, yes, she was out of the office this week, and that's all I know about it. It's possible she could say that, yes, Judge. And do you have any evidence to suggest she knows more than that? Not at not specifically, no, and she has unfortunately not been willing to talk to me. Understood. So that seems that like there's less there for you to work with. There's definitely less there for me to work with. Yes. What else do you think I ought to know about Miss Green then? The, with Miss Green, it's it's really um, so. Miss Yurdy was the one who had this type of relationship before, and Miss Green took over that role, that personal assistant role, and my investigations revealed how Miss um, Yurdy knew all of the travel arrangements, purchasing, things like that. Um, and that's what led me to Miss Green. Okay, all right. <laughs> so um, the other area, all of the other folks for the DA's office are people in security, essentially, investigations and security. They are people who have served as the um, personal detail for Miss Willis. Be, uh, Hill, Green, and Hick, Ricks, right? Yes, Hill, Green, and Ricks. And those folks have served as Miss Willis's, um, she calls them the head of dignitary services. It's essentially the, um, the, the team that follows her around and takes her places. And, and, and they would be able to testify, um, from the witnesses I've talked to, they would be able to testify about she and Nathan going to the safe house together, living at the safe house together, staying there regularly, things like that. Cohabitating, essentially, which disputes what is in the affidavit. But uh, I guess if you're referring to maybe a specific date or time frame, you don't know which of these three witnesses, if any of them, might personally know about that time frame or could. I believe all three of them do. 
I believe okay. all three of them know about that. I've spoken with other people who were formerly on the dignitary services who did not do that and who identified who are the ones that actually would have that direct knowledge, actually did the transport of Ms. Willis and Mr. Wade. And so if either of these individuals came and denied having any knowledge whatsoever, you have someone who could impeach them having made a prior statement explicitly on that point? Yes, I do. All right, what else? Um, I think the only other issue for the district attorney's office was the bank records. I don't know if you wanted me to go ahead and go into that now or wait for Mr. Evans um, to talk about that. The state had. Right, no, I think we'd have to, we'd wanna loop him in on that. But let me just, on this first issue, uh, allow Ms. Cross to jump back in. And so, Ms. Cross, uh, focusing solely on whether uh, defense counsel has made uh, a good faith basis to show that the relevance of these witnesses, even though you know she may not have talked to them or they didn't want to talk to her, mm -hmm. um, why is Quashel still appropriate? Quashel is still appropriate here because even Ms. Merchant's recitation to the court of the facts and circumstances of why these witnesses are relevant displays a misunderstanding of, of the role of these individuals and in particular, the role of Ms. Yerdy. Ms. Yerdy was never part of the executive staff or team. Ms. Yerdy was not someone who kept the district attorney's schedule or calendar. There, I, I, the allegations here are she worked on the media team was her role. The media team, not the executive staff or team or responsible for Callan during the district attorney's office. But just to be clear, I mean, your, your motion doesn't cover Ms. Yerdy. That's, we have to it, it doesn't, it doesn't. But you're saying it, it that doesn't. impacts the argument towards Ms. Green, okay? Correct. All right. Correct. And the other individuals, Ms. Merchant didn't make a representation to the court about how Mr. Bradley would know about the knowledge of Ms. Allen, Mr. Bond, and Ms. Young. That is, I think, relevant information if it's not admissible. Any impeachment evidence she has would not be admissible. Likewise, the security... Why, why, why wouldn't it be admissible? If Mr. Bradley heard that second or third hand that Ms. Allen knew this or Ms. Young was aware of that or Mr. Bond said sure. this to someone but, else... But, that, that, that wasn't the impression I got. The impression I got, and we can correct this while we're all here together, is that they, Mr. Bradley directly overheard a statement from each of these individuals that they could be impeached with. Ms. Merchant, is that accurate? Directly overheard, which ones are you talking about? Uh, well, essentially, that, that kind of seemed to be all of them. Uh, you had said Allen, Bond, Young, and then the investigators, Hill, Green, and Ricks, could all be directly impeached by statements overheard by Mr. Bradley. Yes. All right, Ms. Cross. <clears throat> I uh, will be shocked if Ms. Merchant is able to support that statement. Shocked. I don't believe that's true. I, I, I don't believe even if it was true, and it's not. Um, and can I just say, when we're talking about the timeline and what might be relevant in an evidentiary hearing, there is, I guess we could spend a, a lot of time um, talking about dates and timelines and who is responsible, but for the record and should there be an evidentiary hearing, I understand the court's ruling, there's an evidentiary hearing what the state will establish uh, with unequivocally is that there was no cohabitation. District Attorney Willis and Nathan Wade never lived together, that the representations that have been made to date are just demonstratively untrue. For example, the allegation is that they lived together um, in District Attorney Willis's home prior to District Attorney Willis's father living with her, and that the father, when the father moved in, then Mr. Wade moved out. Of course, that is untrue, and the state would be able to establish that Mr. That Mr. Floyd, District Attorney's father, moved in, even changed his Georgia driver's license prior to the time that the district attorney and Mr. Wade ever met, that the testimony from Mr. Floyd would be that he lived there continuously and never saw Mr. Wade there. The evidence would be that the timeline that's being represented is either mistaken 
if that's charitably, or simply fabricated. So I just want the court to understand that this is the this is the hearing that we're contemplating, and I understand the rulings. But to return to your question about Ms. Allen, Mr. Bond, and Ms. Young, I believe that the spectacle of calling opposing counsel to, in this case, deny that they have any knowledge about a relationship because they didn't have any knowledge about a relationship and certainly none that contradicts the Wade affidavit. Calling them in to say that and then another individual to say, no, I heard otherwise, appears to have very little evidentiary value. I will put it that way. Even if the good faith basis that Ms. Merchant represents has very little evidentiary value. Insofar as the security staff was referenced and mentioned, Again, I don't believe that there is a good faith basis to believe for any witness to say that the two cohabitated, they never did so. I don't believe there's a good faith basis for any witness to say that there was a re relationship prior to 2022 as was represented in the affidavit. These witnesses who have a host of other security sensitive information about the district attorney and her travels and her arrangements and the means by which she is kept safe under the constant threat um, that I think we all recognize is there, that they have, there is no good faith basis to believe that they have any information. Again, she's never spoken to anyone, and I didn't hear a representation that anyone could impeach those witnesses with testimony that they said otherwise. So I think those are properly quashed even without further inquiry. In that last bit, you're referring to the investigators? Yes, sir. Well, I mean, again, I think that's what Ms. Merchant is, is putting out here, that it, her star witness, Mr. Bradley, is able to impeach every one of them. Is that, is that what? I, I didn't hear the representation that Ms. Merchant said that Mr. Bradley told her that he could, he has personal knowledge that investigators Hill, Green, and Ricks had knowledge of a cohabitation or a personal relationship prior to 2022. Ms. Ms. Merchant. Maybe I missed it. And again, knowledge based on statements that they made to someone else who you do have under subpoena and will, will you would intend to have testified to hearing. Yes, and just, right. just for background, when Kay Willis took office, Mr. Bradley had a contract. So did Mr. Campbell. They all had contracts. The whole firm, they, there were three partners, Bradley, Wade, Campbell, three person firm. They all three had contracts to work at the DA's office. So they're all working at the DA's office in some capacity. Two of them had these taint contracts. So Bradley had, he had two contracts actually. He had a first appearance contract. So did Mr. Campbell and Mr. Bradley and Mr. Campbell also had these taint attorney contracts where they're working directly for the anti-corruption unit. So it's not just this this lawyer that he's partners with out in Cobb County. They're all together. They're all intimately well, well, all together. I mean, that's, that's, that's good by way of background, but uh, really I just think just to get through over that threshold today, and uh, Ms. Cross, I'll let you have the, the last word here, but I don't know how many times, you know, or you, you may have argued at a closing the, the pattern instruction that a single witness, if believed, can establish a fact. What I'm hearing is, is a, again, emphasizing the conflict in the evidence, and if the state is, can, it sounds quite confident that it's gonna have an abundance of evidence to, to show these things are not true at the hearing, but I don't see how I can make that determination on the front end without live testimony subject to cross-examination and an assessment of demeanor and everything else that goes into those kind of determinations. I don't see a way around that. Any, any final thoughts for me? Only, Your Honor, that I'd ask the court to hold or reserve ruling on the state's motion to quash until Mr. Bradley, who appears to be the sole and primary source for the allegations that have been made, until he testifies um, at a hearing, and then if you're not otherwise inclined to quash the subpoenas, that they be revisited at that time. All right, I think that is appropriate. So to that end, one thing I would, I would share is that, obviously, as we've talked about, the rules of evidence would apply, but this is uh, much more so than I would do in front of a jury. I plan to be proactive about the application of 403 and 611. And so if there's anything that's cumulative, if there's anything that uh, is referring to 
as in the words of the rule, harassment or undue embarrassment, I'm not going to feel inhibited from stepping in, even without an objection from counsel, uh, to move this along and keep it focused on the issues at hand. So to that end, uh, I do think that, again, under on the court's authority to control the order and manner of presentation of the evidence, it would be important that from the outset we're not talking um, about calling uh, Ms. Willis as the first witness, and we need to get over uh, a few procedural uh, hurdles before we can get there. So uh, I, I agree with Ms. Cross on that point. So, However, when it comes to the issue at hand, uh, I, I think Ms. Merchant has established a good faith basis for relevance, and I don't see how quashel can can be imposed here. Um, I think it's a closer call with Miss Green. Um, that may may yet result in quashel, but at this point, with each one of these witnesses, I would defer the ruling until we get further into the hearing itself. All right. Anything else, Miss Cross? I know you had. Um, also talked about the bank records, and uh, as it relates to the privilege issues with Mr. Bradley, I think those just need to be handled as the questions are put to him, and if it needs to go into an in-camera session, um, we can do that, but it sounds like Ms. Merchant is aware of that issue. We would need to establish when and how and the scope of his representation of Mr. Wade, and we could proceed very carefully to make sure that uh, issues of privilege are not uh, gone into. Thank you, Your Honor. We, of course, you know, Mr. Evans will um, will speak to the bank records. And so far as there is a privilege, again, Mr. Wade does not wait, does not waive any portion of it. And if that could be a conversation that takes place in chambers, uh, as opposed to um, in open court, I think that would that would be beneficial for everyone. Let me turn then to Mr. Evans. I think it did uh, join us by Zoom now. And um, can you hear me, Your Honor? I can. I can. There's a bit of an echo. Give us a few more. Is that better? That's much better. Um, all right. So, having reviewed your motion to quash and the reply, and with the benefit of what you've just heard before. My remaining concern deals with scope and overbreadth. Uh, I think the subpoena is pretty broad there. So maybe we could start start with that, Mr. Evans. Anything else you'd like to add? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. The, um, the, the scope is, is, is not just overly broad, it's limitless. It requests any and all documents in Synovus Bank's possession related to Nathan J. Wade, Nathan J. Wade, PC, Nathan J. Wade, PC, and or Wade Bradley and Campbell Law Firm. So there's no dates given, no scope is provided, no reason requesting these documents is mentioned, and no connection to the criminal charges against Roman is cited. So you mentioned a reply. I have not seen any reply filed. I did not. Um, so Okay, uh, I suppose it didn't relate to to your specific motion to quash. Uh, let me, but let me just start right there. There's no date range whatsoever in this, Ms. Merchant. Why is that not quashal just on itself? Uh, Judge, it's and if there's no date range, then it's you're supposed to have certain records. So I've I've already received most of the bank records. I need a business record certificate, which is what I sent with the subpoena, because I cannot admit those records at a hearing without that business record certificate. Um, I also, the records I have ended in November, I believe, um, they're voluminous. And I wanted to be able to do a summary under 1006 for the court because I don't, I, I agree, I don't want to go into tons of bank records. Um, I don't think 98% you know, of them aren't relevant, but 2% are. Um, and so in order to get them into evidence, I've got to have a business record certificate. I had to subpoena the banks to get that business record certificate. Um, I've got the documents from I've got a business record certificate that was filed in the divorce case, but I don't have one for this case. So, and the one that was filed in the divorce, or the one that was received in the divorce case, I believe ended in November, those records. So that's why, um, that's why we need them. So you're, the only thing you're after still, you're saying is, a, is for Sonovus Bank to have signed a certification? Yes, sir. All right. 
So just a kind of a sub issue here. Where, what authority do you have that someone can be subpoenaed and forced to authenticate a document? Uh, they can't be forced to authenticate the documents so that they authenticated in the Cobb County case. And it's, it's. Or even the ones they produced. Well, they haven't produced any in response to this, right? No, they have not. You're saying you've got what you need already from the Cobb County case. Right. And you need a further record certification for, for what exactly? So I have the records that were submitted under the business record certificate in the Cobb County case. That's a civil case, so it's a little bit different rules, but not major different rules because of business records. Um, so I've got that business record certificate. They certified those records. I've got that. Um, but I wanted one for this case, a business record certificate for this case. So that oh, I just, could you just want a different case number on the business record certificate. Well, it's the same records. I mean, I didn't I, I did not anticipate this would be a big deal. Why why do they need a different case number? Why wouldn't a business record certification for another case apply in this one? I was just being overly cautious to try and get it because I, I anticipated an objection to that um, because they were certified in that case. If there's okay. no issue with that, then I've got the business record certificate. Well, I'm not gonna I won't rule on it proactively unless I see whether there's an objection from the other side and what argument they have on it, and that would be up to the state. But to the original point, even if you've subpoenaed someone for a business record certification, is that an appropriate use of a subpoena? It, well, to, I would bring them here to get the records, because if I don't have the business record certificate, then right. they have to take the stand and I get them in sure. that way. So, so that's why I subpoenaed them. So you've been, so they are, the bank itself is a person has acknowledged subpoena from the or service, excuse me, from the bank? Yes, yes, I've talked with the bank. The bank actually has a lawyer, and um, they don't want to come to court. They want to submit a business record certificate. Right. And I don't have any problem with that. Like I told them, I just need that in advance of the hearing so I can put the state on notice of it. All right, Mr. Evans, uh, having seen that the scope of your motion to quash is very much a more narrow focus than perhaps we thought, any uh, reaction? Well, Sonovus refused to produce the records pending the motion to quash, so I don't know about all the, I mean, they haven't agreed to, to produce anything, but what, what is the purpose of trying to get the personal and law firm bank records? What, what is the goal here? Sure. Like, that, that's part of what, what's overly broad about this is not, not just that there's no dates, not just that there's no scope. But there's no connection to the underlying crimes charged against Roman, neither alleged nor could there be. Like, what is hope to hope? What, what are we hoping to even discover here? Number one, how would that be relevant? Number two, and, and, and just what is the general purpose of all this? I mean, keep, keep in mind this subpoena went to Synovus, it never went to my client. Ms. Merchant hid it from my client. We only knew about this because Synovus properly and timely alerted us of the subpoena. So all of this was meant to be kept outside of our knowledge. So it's it's done in secret. It's done in a way that, that has no limit whatsoever on it. And it's done with no reason mentioned. So what what is the goal here? Sure. Okay, Mr. Evans. Um, and and so I'm clear. The subpoena is isn't is is not just the law firm records. It's also Mr. Wade's personal bank account records. Is that right, Ms. Merchant? He doesn't have any um, personal bank account records from Synovus. It's a it's law firm records. Okay. So other than maybe showing or proving how much money the law firm received as a result of the representation, what's what's why do we need these? There's quite a few different bank accounts, which is why I don't mean to sound vague. It's just there's a couple different bank accounts, and I have all of the bank records, and we put a lot of that in our motion, um, our response, so that the court would have some specifics as to the money that was spent. But essentially, the money's being spent on Miss Willis. Some of the money is being spent on Miss Willis, and so it's relevant to show that she has a personal or financial interest, which is the entire issue of disqualification. So the hearing that we subpoenaed these records for has nothing to do with the guilt or innocence of Mr. Roman. Well, you don't have to address that. Okay. Um, but I guess going back to the to the core point here, the subpoena that issue did not have any limitation on time. And, and Judge, that, 
And I, I apologize, I already had the records and so I wanted them to certify the records. I did not anticipate it would be an issue like this. And so I, I normally when you serve a subpoena like that, they would contact us, and, and which they did. And I actually reached out to them to try and um, narrow this issue. I did not assume that it would turn it, it I didn't mean to hide the ball on the dates or anything like that. Like it's it's the records we have that I wanted certified. Well, uh, I think the re we can't amend it after the fact, and and so you can try to reserve it, I suppose, before Thursday. But the subpoena in front of me, uh, I think, uh, goes too far, and or you can try to use the record certification you have elsewhere. If you think that's and that's what I, I can just do that, Judge. And we did file the the returns, so I mean, we're not trying to hide anything. Sure. Um, the returns. That's I believe how they got them. All right, Mr. Evans, so I'm granting your motion. Anything else you think we need to address on your behalf? No, Your Honor, thank you. Okay, thank you for joining us. Let me turn over to Mr. Banks, if you're still with us. I am, Judge, uh, good afternoon. All right, good afternoon, sir. Uh, any particular order you wanna go in? Um, I can address mine first, Judge. I mean, um, I, I'm sure the court has read the pleading. Uh, Ms. Merchant actually filed a response. Um, I mean, in my, in my pleading, as it concerns my motion to quash, you know, of course I represented that I have no personal or direct knowledge um, concerning the, the issues that are germane uh, to this court or that are pending before this court. Um, I mean, taking a, um, a glance at what the court has already discussed with, with Ms. Cross in, in the state's motion, um, I would submit that, I mean, I mean, if she's saying that I have relevant information and that at some point she has a witness to reflect that I have direct or indirect knowledge concerning, um, the issues that are germane to, to this court, then, um, you know, I, I guess we would just have to wait and see. I, I would submit to this court, however, that I don't. And I mean, it is a fishing, fishing expedition as it concerns me. Um, I mean, I, I guess arguably if she wanted to question me about whether I was considered to be the special prosecutor, um, th that certainly would be relevant. But based upon my lack of knowledge concerning any romantic relationship um, um, prior to um, um, uh, her, her, her motions and the issues brought out uh, before this court, um, I, um, I have no direct or indirect knowledge. And so I, I do think it's a fishing expedition. And of course, if she wants to respond and suggest that she has a witness that will contradict that evidence, then, then so be it. We can, just, we can just deal with it at that time. Okay, and I'd, I'd note, uh, Ms. Merchant, that if it's solely to say that he was considered to be special counsel as well, excuse me, um, uh, special assistant, that that's gonna go more into the qualifications area that I don't see as germane and necessary for an evidentiary hearing, but over to you. And I'm um, sorry, I think what Mr. Banks was kind of suggesting was a due to the pleading and the pleading, you know, just for a little backup, um, that's what I planned on attempting to do with the order. Um, as far as some of the surrounding stuff is just too much. Sure. Uh, but I'd also like, he has other clients and other obligations, and if there's really nothing of relevance, then I think we need to at least have some kind of, as we did with the other witnesses, an initial upfront showing of that. So uh, as we walked through, just at a surface level, with the district attorney employees, what is it that Mr. Banks you think is going to testify to that, um, that you're going to be either able to, he's going to go along with you, or that you're going to be able to impeach? Well, uh, and I can appreciate the need not to want to have to present your entire case today, but at the same time, I think we may need some more specifics, and if that has to be in camera, then we can do that. It, I mean, it's just Mr. Bradley has two calls that he can refer to. All right.
right? And and those calls would be relevant and admissible how? It depends on if he's cross-examined about it, but it's also his fear in testifying. I mean, that's something that the state regularly asks witnesses if they want to be there to testify. Um, you know, if, if they, to the, to the veracity for the court. You know, he's not, he doesn't want to be part of this. He doesn't want to come and take the stand. And so I think when he goes into that, um, Is your contention that uh, Mr. Banks um, made some of these calls? Yes. All right. Okay, Mr. Banks, back to you. Uh, I mean, I, I, to the extent that I had conversations with Mr. Bradley um, about it, um, I mean, if, if, I mean, there's certainly conversations that I had. I, I called him, um, and, and I'm happy to talk about it, but. I, I called him on a personal level because one, he's my friend and two, he's my fraternity brother. Um, and I know that um, ultimately these type of things are very uh, stressful. Um, I was concerned ultimately about um, uh, him being emotional given his prior relationship with, um, with, with Mr. Wade um, of not being able to see the forest beyond the trees when you, when you actually are making decisions on an emotional basis and based upon um, my understanding that he had, had represented Mr. Wade um, dating back as far as 2015, notwithstanding the fact that the divorce proceeding wasn't wasn't filed until 2021, it's, it's my understanding that I was concerned personally as my fraternity brother and as another member of the bar that, that he might arguably be uh, running afoul of the attorney-client privilege, and so I did have a conversation with him about that, and just expressed my concern. And if that was a way to intimidate, if intimidate, if that's what he's suggesting, I mean, I would take issue with that. And in fact, we we laughed, and he he he, he said we need to get together for a drink afterwards. And and so, um, um, uh, but but if that's what she wants to call me about is my conversation with Mr. Bradley, I don't. I'm, I'm not sure that that's 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 relevant at sure. this point. Um, OK, and well, and I think that sounds like something that's just we're going to have to see as the hearing begins and, and what we get through as to whether yep. it becomes relevant and it becomes an issue. And sure. so I don't think I can your 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 motion would be able to be granted today, um, but we'll see. You can re-raise it at the hearing if you think it's necessary. And I also okay. think I, I would imagine you may have other uh, if you have other conflicts Thursday and Friday, I don't think it's necessary to have you waiting outside the courtroom for those two straight days. So we'll just put you on a two hour call if that works. Well, the only conflict for the court's awareness is uh, on the 15th. I have, a, I have to be in federal court in Macon. Yeah. Um, and so to the extent that you could get to me on one of those other days, that would be great and, and preferable um, or. Um, um, but, but I have to be in federal court right, and make it 1 p.m. Well, we'll be in touch about any logistics. Uh, okay. So as it relates to Mr. Campbell and knowing, I understand uh, on the front end, is it, the same, is it a similar argument? I know you it raised a similar argument privilege. to Mr. Bradley, Judge, and, and based upon the court's earlier kind of discussion and colloquy with, with uh, Ms. Cross and, and Ms. Merchant, um, I'd assume that they're not trying to go into attorney-client privilege. I will just take issue. I mean, it seems to, uh, Ms. Merchant's response seemed to suggest that because he wasn't counsel of record in the divorce that somehow or another, he hadn't gleaned information that was related to the attorney-client privilege. My understanding is that Ms. Mr. Campbell or Attorney Campbell uh, joined the Wade Law Firm back in 2012 and that at or around 2015 is when, you know, um, um, the issues concerning whether or not Mr. Wade was going to get a divorce with his current wife um, um, came up and that the firm began to represent him at or around that time. And so to the extent that she's seeking to get into information concerning what he gleaned, albeit not a counsel of record, but a member of that firm, that um, and um, I would submit that that would certainly be an issue that we would be seeking to um, avoid him testifying about. Ms. Merchant, any response? Um, Judge, I just, 
I want to make sure that I'm clear. Um, there was also some allegations in Mr. Banks' petition that um, they were business associates, and so that I, I don't know if they were arguing there was some type of privilege. I can't find anything to indicate that they're business associates, um, and I couldn't find anything to indicate that Mr. Campbell ever represented Mr. Wade. Well, isn't the firm Wade and Campbell? Yeah, but they're not. <laughs> but if you go to the bar website, it's not. And if you go to the Secretary of State, it's not. Um, and to further complicate matters, um, Mr. Campbell has a taint room conflict contract right now and has had it for the entire time Ms. Willis has been there. He is doing taint review under Garrity for Mr. Wade's anti-corruption unit. So I don't think they are partners because I think that would be problematic for them to be doing taint review of privileged material that is being reviewed by. Well, I'll, I'll, uh, I think with those red flags, I think that's also worth noting that we've got two witnesses here, Mr. Bradley and Mr. Campbell, where uh, privilege issues are being waived. And I think to the extent possible, we could burn hours getting into these issues. So I think um, we're going to have to be ready to address those efficiently in determining the scope and manner of the representations um, or save them towards later in the presentation of the evidence. So uh, Mr. Mr. Banks, any initial, just on that last point about is there any privileges as it relates to something related to their business association or the, is the sole focus that may come up if he's called to testify relating to the attorney-client privilege? Um, I didn't, exp I mean, I, I, I use the word business partner because he is, um, th they are partners at this point in time, whether they were partners way back when, when they joined the firm back, when he joined the firm in 2012, I don't think that that was the case. Having said that, to the extent that he gleaned confidential um, information through the attorney-client privilege, while being a member of that firm, I mean, it would be much like a paralegal who wouldn't, wouldn't be able to, I mean, divulge privileged information at, while working um, ultimately with that firm. Now, that's as it concerns any information that, that he uh, gleaned concerning the relationship between um, Mr. Wade and, 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 and Ms. Willis during the pendency of the divorce proceeding. And prior to the Pendency of the divorce proceeding. Frankly, I don't think that the attorney-client privilege um, um, starts when someone files an entry of appearance or files a complaint, for that matter. I think sure. attorney-client relationship. All things we'll have to get through. Yeah. Uh, all right, but for today, I think there's at least that uh, basic threshold showing of relevance where he may end up having to be called at this hearing. So uh, I'll defer ruling uh, as the record develops. We can re-raise it. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Banks. If there's anything. All right. Else. Thank you, Judge. All right. Take care. All right. We still you. have uh, Mr. Partridge and Ms. Monroe. So let me turn to uh, motion to quash filed on behalf of Ms. Yerdy. All right. Good afternoon, Judge. Uh, Durante Partridge on behalf of Ms. Yerdy. Yes, sir. So uh, it probably makes more sense to start with Ms. Merchant on this. Yes, Judge. Willis was staying at. Um, she has an immense amount of knowledge that's relevant to this case about their relationship prior to Mr. Wade being appointed. In this case, they've been best friends since college um, for 30 something years and has knowledge of the relationship. The relationship prior has knowledge of them staying in the apartment. She owns the apartment. Um, so. All right. All right, Mr. Partridge, in light of this conflict in the evidence over the relationship, uh, what do you think the grounds would still be for Quashel at this stage? Yes, Judge, thank you so much. Um, first and foremost, just to uh, clear a uh, discrepancy with what Ms. Merchant just said, my part, I'm sorry, my client does not own the property whatsoever. She was leasing the property at the time and subsequently moved out of the property to move into another property that she was renting. Uh, as well, and Ms. Willis continued to reside at the property. So my client did not know anything uh, that was going on at the property when she moved out. So 
just to clear that first and foremost, Shauna. Uh, it was a rental. I said only when that had authority over the unit. Yeah. All right, Mr. Uh, Partridge. Thank you, Judge. Furthermore, Yana, um, with regard to this situation, we we called it a fishing expedition as well, uh, merely because Ms. Yardy does not have any information as it relates to that of um, a, a romantic relationship or any relationship or what took place at the property after she moved out. Um, I communicated that information to that of Ms. Merchant uh, um, from from that of Ms. Yarty, so she just has absolutely zero else to add to. Okay. Uh, Ms. Merchant, do you have anything that would impeach that testimony if that's what she testifies to at the hearing? Yes, uh, she has personal knowledge of the relationship. And, and how would you impeach that? Um, I can impeach that with Mr. Bradley, um, but I, I believe that Ms. Yarty will testify truthfully and tell this court that she Okay, Mr. Partridge, back to you. Uh, yes, Judge, I, I would I, I would disagree as it relates to the representation that Ms. Merchant made. If there's any information or testimony that Mr. Bradley has, uh, we'd also ask the court to reserve ruling uh, as to Ms. Yardy's involvement with regard to this, uh, this particular situation to see what information comes from Mr. Bradley. Otherwise, Your Honor, this would be um, a fishing expedition because there's no information that Ms. Merchant has stated to the court that would suggest that my client has actual knowledge of a personal relate or a romantic relationship or Mr. Wade staying at the uh, that particular residence with Ms. Willis. All right. Well, it's just a matter of logistics here. Are you suggesting that Mr. Bradley should be allowed to go into statements he's heard from your client before she's called? Because generally you impeach someone after they've said something that they can be impeached with, right? Yes, Judge, and I, and I understand that, Your Honor. My concern, however, is that there's nothing that we've been presented with. There's nothing in the subpoena to Ms. Yardy that says or indicates that she has, you know, any information beyond that of what Mr. Bradley has said to that of Ms. Marchant, which is essentially all that we have, all that I've been put on notice about, is that Mr. Bradley, you know, as the person, or, or rather, before today, it was there. There's another witness, a lawyer, that has something to say as it relates sure. to that. Of so, if Mr. Bradley were to testify as, say, the first called witness that he had had a conversation with your client, without going into what it was or what the substance was, and that generally that conversation contained information about the nature and extent of the relationship, is that thing going to open your client up to being called? Um, it it potentially would in that situation, Your Honor, but. I guess we'd have to get to that point. I'm not sure what information he would have. I've not had the opportunity to reach out to Mr. Bradley, who I know also judge, and uh, so I'm not sure. But according to my conversations, repeated conversation with Ms. Yardy, um, there's no information as it relates to her knowledge because, again, she moved out of the condo or the residence. Okay. Focusing on that, so I didn't highlight it. But there's also this issue of the media statements, um, all of those types of statements. So Miss Yurdy, I think this is instructive for the court. Miss Yurdy was the person at the DA's office who actually had an account to monitor the critical mention media. So Miss um, Willis spent uh, ha had a contract with a, a company called Critical Mention, and what they are is they're a media monitoring company. Sure, they and, and remind me, is your argument just to say that? that is a motivating factor in this case and is underlying her forensic comments? Oh, yes, definitely, Judge. Okay. Yes, and Ms. Yardy is the one that actually anal like got had those reports. There were two people that had access to it at first, and Ms. Yardy is one of those. So she's one of the people that responded to Ms. Willis and, and would give her these reports and, and talk about these reports with her. But she also, I mean, the, the, the critical information is that this is her place. That sure. So... Uh, understood, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm, thank you for flagging that. I think that's likely to fall solely within that box of, of things I don't think would be coming out in an evidentiary hearing in terms of the forensic misconduct, but we'll take it as it comes. Uh, all right, Mr. Partridge, uh, thank you for joining us today. Uh, I don't believe that I can grant your motion to quash at this time. Understood, Your Honor. And if I may, just for the record, Judge, there was something else mentioned as well, uh, I believe, when Ms. Cross 
was presenting, uh, Ms. Merchant stated that Ms. Yerdy was the personal assistant and kept calendars for that of Ms. Willis, and that is also untrue, Judge, just for the record. She was a um, not an assistant, Your Honor. She did styling for Ms. Willis as well as uh, some public relations work for Ms. Willis during her campaign, Your Honor. Okay. Understood. Take care, Ms. Partridge. Thank you, too, Judge. Uh, Hold up. been reaching out to Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley has retained counsel. He does not want people to continue to reach out to him. So I would just <laughs> please put everyone on notice that he does not want everyone to keep speaking. Who, who is this counsel? Um, it's D.C. Chopra. Can you say that one more time and spell it for the record? Mm -hmm. Well, he goes by D.C. Chopra. It's um, female. B-I-M-A-L. It's his last name is Chopra. C-H-O-P-R-A. Okay. And because he was getting calls from people sure. who were under subpoena. All right, uh, I think that leaves us then with Ms. Monroe on behalf of the DA's office as well. On Fulton, yes, good the, afternoon. The, the Fulton County Attorney. Okay. Okay, so thank you, Judge, for putting this case on uh, your motion calendar on such late notice. Uh, so the reason for our motion to quash is number one, these documents that were requested have been provided to the defendant's counsel by way of the Fulton County portal. All right, we let's, have evidence. Let's, let's, let's go to specifics. I, I'm, I'm looking at a copy of exhibit A of the subpoena. It's got seven bullets. Which of those mm -hmm. are you contending have already been provided? Um, so it is our under, I don't know this specifically, but it's our understanding that about, um, a majority of the responses have been provided and viewed by defendants counsel. Um, and if not provided directly through the portal, it has been attached to the various motions, uh, as supporting documentation in this case, and also readily available by public information. Um, well, you, which ones haven't been though? Cause that could still be relevant for the subpoena. Um, it's our understanding that, uh, I don't have that direct information, but, um, in light of the, in light of the responses that have not been provided, there is no relevance for the information. Um, we have a criminal case, uh, these the things that are that they're asking for has there's no connection there is no relevance and the defendant admits that there's no reason in which uh, these documents were there was no reason provided um as to why these documents were requested um and in order for in order for a subpoena to be issued in this fashion there needs to be a material reason for the subpoena and in this case we do not have one Okay, Ms. Merchant, what haven't you gotten that was on Exhibit A and why is it relevant? Yes, sir. Um, so I have not gotten all of the invoices um, for Mr. Wade. I started asking for those back in September through the open records and I got some of them piecemeal. I got a couple others um, that the state attached to their motion. So the, the open records officer said I had gotten everything and then the state attached a couple more. So now I have even more, but there's still a couple that are outstanding. Um, so there's several that are outstanding and we put that um, in a very detailed pleading in letter to the Fulton County um, County Attorney. We have not received a single invoice for Mr. Bradley. We do not have a current contract for Anna Cross or John Floyd. Um, and the issue with that is that Ms. Willis made statements that she paid them the same amount of money. The contracts we have for Mr. Floyd, that is an incorrect statement. Um, they were, he was not paid the same amount of money. We do not have either contract, current contracts for either of those folks. Um, we don't have anything about the, the time off requests. We don't have anything about the reimbursements um, for Ms. Willis, and we don't have anything um, in regards what to the last you, bullet point. What makes you think the travel reimbursements? The person because everything seemed to be personal travel. No, well, Judge, um, that's we're not sure that it's all personal travel, and I don't believe that it is. Um, the personal. This is all evidence that is related to us showing that Ms. Willis had a personal and a financial interest in this prosecution. Um, reimbursements for her travel. Mr. We have some reimbursements for Mr. Wade's travel. So are those trips connected? Those were the things that we're seeking. We sought all of these through open records. These are open records, but the county has been refusing to give them to us despite way longer than three days. So before this hearing was set, we already were in litigation over the open records violation. 
these are things we're entitled to. We don't have to show that they're relevant in the open records context. Sure. But so then we get a hearing, and instead of waiting for the litigation and them to actually give us the documents to the open records, I have to get them in through a business certificate. So I can't submit an open records. So I cannot submit all of these invoices. These invoices are hearsay. I need a business record certificate. I sent a sur subpoena to the county asking for a business record certificate. They have to certify the documents they've already given me. Plus, they've got to give me the documents that they haven't given me. OK, uh, let's keep making our way down the list. I can see your argument on travel and vacation, since that's at the core of your allegations. The last one, though, talking about all hiring and outside counsel, that seems to go more towards what I'd indicated has a lot less relevance for me. Um, hiring an outside counsel for? Just generally it says any outside counsel. Process for hiring bids, payment of outside counsel. Are you talking about, and um, I just want to make sure. The final bullet, any and all courses. Oh, okay, I understand. I, I want to make sure because I, I got, I printed theirs out right before I left the office. Um, the, this is in regards to a board of county commissioners meeting that was held in November 2023. Um, there was a very detailed conversation between Dexter Bonds and um, I can't remember her name, but she's the purchasing director for Cobb County or for um, Fulton County. They had a very detailed discussion and said that there had been a problem with the processing of invoices with the district attorney and that they had to talk with her and go through a new rebidding um, training with them because essentially they were having services that weren't going through the proper channels. We believe that these documents are relevant to show the personal financial interest of the district attorney. Uh, how so? Getting things paid for without approval. Okay, so that, that's going more towards the approval aspect of it and the, you know, maybe county, what you would refer to as, you know, impropriety and uh, sticking to county regs. Is that fair? Not necessarily county regs, but also sticking to the statute, which is the basis for all of this, the statute that was not followed, um, right. which is the basis. But also what, what we're... What are these, is she having a personal financial benefit to this prosecution by submitting invoices and things like that? Um, I just wanna uh, add and just provide for the clarification. It's our understanding that pursuant to the subpoena um, and the information that's being requested there in our possession, Fulton County Attorney's Office, uh, all of that information has been provided. But in terms of the open requests that were submitted, the separate open requests that were submitted to the district attorney's office uh, on a separate open records request, we wouldn't have privy, we wouldn't have personal knowledge as to what requests have been fulfilled or not. But in terms of what we have in possession in our office, we have uh, that information has been provided already by the district attorney's office. So there's nothing outstanding pursuant to this subpoena that we would have um, that they don't have access to already. Okay, uh, so just to be. I don't have anything authentic. I haven't received one single authentication from them. And I think I think that's what it comes down to. She's receiving. She's she's seeking authentication. Um, we just want to make sure that we are fulfilling our end. And if this is information that she has already received. Um, by you know doing use uh, abusing the legal process with subpoenas just to obtain authentication it's not a proper use of the legal system nor is it um, coupled with the fact there is a pending litigation as Ms. Merchant so emphasized uh, pending against the district attorney's office regarding a, a potent, an alleged open records act violation. Um, well, how else would she authenticate it then, Ms. Monroe? Are you planning to come down? And, and have someone personally uh, uh, testify to it? Without a subpoena? Oh. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. Well, I mean, more to the point, um, it, it, it seems the, this conversation keeps shifting. It's, it's either it, the, the county attorney does not have the items requested, or is the sole issue now just authentication? of the items that she already has, the defense already has. Your Honor, um, may I be permitted to speak? This is Shalonda Miller. I am the designated records custodian for Fulton County. Okay. And um, I might be able to provide some clarification. 
individuals request open records. We are not required to authenticate responses to open records requests. That's not a part of the Open Records Act. We are also not required to produce anything that we do not have in our possession, even when individuals think we do. Um, I'll give an example there, Ms. Murphy. No, I, I don't. I, I agree with you. I don't. I don't need an example. Uh, but I guess all that would remain then is what Ms. Merchant is saying, that if all she's after is authentication, and that hasn't been provided, but she thinks that a witness she has she never subpoenaed, requested authentication, Your Honor, absent this subpoena. All that right. Was, wasn't a request. Um, the the first time we saw anything about authentication was at the service of the subpoena. Okay. All right, so Ms. Merchant, where does this stand then? Judge, this is two things. First, that's how we have to get business record certificates is we have to subpoena the witness, and if they want to avoid coming and testifying, they can submit a business records affidavit. We drew one up and submitted it with the subpoena. So I believe we followed the proper procedure to get these records cert certified. Um, as far as that they've given us everything they have, they have not. Um, as far as the first bullet point, we do not have invoice number 22 or 25. It's not been attached to anybody's pleadings. It's not anywhere, any, any place. Okay, let's start there. So, Ms. Monroe, is invoice 22 or 25 something that's in the possession of Fulton County? Not that we're aware of, Your Honor. Who would typically have retain custody of those kind of things, those invoices or reimbursement requests? Would that just stay with the district attorney or would, the, would Fulton County have all those? The district attorney, and we'll follow up with our client, but it's our understanding that they've provided the records they do have. I'm, I'm not sure what and R25 may not be a part of those records, but we can confirm that all that we have in our possession has been provided. I've been asking for invoice 22 through 25. Okay. All right. And Ms. Merchant, you were talking about, you said that the next three bullets were invoices for Mr. Bradley, contracts for Ms. Cross and Mr. Floyd. Uh, I guess turning to Ms. Monroe or Ms. Miller, are those also things that you're saying are not in the possession of Fulton County and only in the possession of the district attorney? We're not trying to delineate between the district attorney and Fulton County. What we're saying is our clients provide us those records, the records that they have in their possession. There are presumptions about what should exist and what we should have in our possession. But just because individuals think they exist doesn't mean we necessarily have them in our possession um, for whatever reason. Okay, understood. Do you have them though? No, not that we're aware of. And we have conferred with our client and it is our understanding that everything that is in the client's possession has been provided. Okay, so then that sounds like a follow-up question to their client, the district attorney's office, if they've been under subpoena for these same documents. But for now, the person subpoenaed is saying, or the entity subpoenaed is saying they don't have them. And unless counsel has a reason to show that they do, I think that's usually the end of it. I, Ms. Cross appeared today, I believe under contract. Um, she's been submitting invoices, so I mean, maybe they just come and testify as to how they have people well, under no, contract. It's not, it's not that it doesn't exist. It's where is it? And, and have you subpoenaed the right entity or person? Um, so. Well, they have represented that they represent the district attorney. They even filed this motion to quash saying they represented the district attorney. So that's I a, that's a very good point. So Ms. Miller, Ms. Monroe, uh, regardless of whether they're down the hall or across the street, if if you are the entity where legal process has to go in order to serve the district attorney's office for production, how does that get you out of complying with the subpoena? Your Honor, I, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to interrupt, and you can tell me to wait, and I will gladly do it. But insofar as we're talking about a subsequent contract for me, there, there is none in existence. Okay. And that's, but that's again, we, we, I keep hearing two different things. Either it exists or it doesn't exist, or someone has or doesn't have it. And then we kind of flip, we keep flipping back and forth between the two, and I'm trying to nail this down. Uh, Apologies, Your Honor, for being unclear. Anything that we have in our possession that our client has in its possession, we have provided. Okay. There are assumptions about things that we have that are inaccurate, 
because we've provided everything that either our office or the district attorney's office has. Okay. So, We're not trying to hide uh, anything. No, that, no that, that makes it clearer. So that, so that you're saying that you would be, either you or collectively the DA's office would be responsible for providing these if you have them. And your understanding, just again, going back to the first bullet point, is um, that a invoice 22 or 25 has already been provided. Uh, it may not have been provided, Your Honor, but if it hasn't been provided, it's because we don't have it in our possession. And not. And when I say we, I'm saying a collective we, the district attorney's office. Okay. Or thank you. I think that's where I've been getting held up. Okay. But that says that's said. You're that's something you plan to follow up and confirm. We will so, definitely follow up for the. We have followed up numerous times with our client, but we will again for the purposes of the court here. All right. Fair enough. And as for the remaining items contracts with Floyd, Cross, Bradley. Is it the same thing that collectively you either think they've been provided or they don't exist? Correct. All right. Ms. Merchant? We would just ask that they come for, in, I mean, obviously they can't do a business record certificate to say something doesn't exist. So um, I think it just makes sense then for me to not even ask for the business record certificate and ask them to just bring the certified documents, whatever they have, and testify on uh, the first day of trial. It seems the only way to figure out what exists, doesn't exist, existed. I mean, invoice 22 has been paid. Invoice 25 has been paid. Sure. So someone has them. Okay, so I, I think ultimately it, it's, if there is something that you are being compelled to provide that does not exist, or that has already been provided, and you can confirm that, then you, there is no obligation on your part to do anything further with the subpoena. Uh, however, it appears that in order to complete the evidentiary record, uh, counsel needs at least some kind of testimony establishing the absence of a record or uh, testimony authenticating records that have already been produced. And so if there's not going to be a certification to that effect, then they would need to be live testimony to that end. And so I don't think that an outright quashel is uh, what happens with this motion or Fulton County. Understood, yeah. If there are other particulars that come up between now and Thursday and you think you want more guidance or clarification, we can we can take it up. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you can all for joining us. Can we be excused, Rob? Of course, thank you. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good afternoon. All right, are there any other, I think we got through them all. Uh, anything else, or anyone else here who anticipated needing to address the court, Ms. Cross, anything else? Just a minor logistical point, Your Honor. Yes, ma'am. Uh, at any evidence share hearing on Thursday, we would um, ask the court's permission to have a witness who's out of state testify remotely. All right, can you identify that witness? Yes, it's uh, District Attorney's father. His name is Mr. Floyd. He's in California. All right, Ms. Merchant, is that something you're prepared to address at the moment? Um, if I can speak with him ahead of time, then I can, I, I'd very likely to agree and not object to that. Um, I believe the notice that was submitted, All right. um, but I just ask that I be allowed to speak with him. Okay, and Ms. Cross, is that solely for logistical reasons, or are there other, perhaps, uh, medical concerns or other things that might compel remote testimony? There are medical um, conditions, as I'm aware, none that affect um, the witness's abil ability to appear, um, but I believe there, there are some medical issues involved um, in addition to the out-of-state travel. Okay, understood. I'll let you and Ms. Merchant take that up, and you can let Thank me you. know if that's something we still need to address before Thursday. Um, as I mentioned, we've set aside all day Thursday. We've also set aside Friday. And we'll um, see if further time is, is required, depending on where the hearing takes us. Um, in terms of logistics, uh, I know a number of defense counsel have adopted the motion and joined it. Many of them are with us today. Ms. Merchant, have you had any conversations with counsel as to how, they, how you would proceed? Are you planning to... Are they all planning to have you as their flag bearer? Or are they all, um, when it comes to arguments, when it comes to uh, direct or cross-examination? Um, I haven't 
um, had that specific um, question, I think that I'm probably going to be leading um, it, but I'm not sure. They, they filed a little bit different motions. Some of them had some different allegations, so they may have their own issues. Um, as far as that, I did have one um, housekeeping matter that